honored guests, participants, producers, and hosts, the University of Houston. My name is Captain David Moskoff. I am deeply privileged to introduce and co-chair this important panel from our National Brain Trust at the 11th Annual Maritime Risk Symposium. Our esteemed panelists include Captain John Sanford with the National Maritime Intelligence Integration Office, Mr. Craig Moss with the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Dr. Martin Luther from the University of South Florida College of Marine Science, and Mr. Darren Shelton, co-founder of Fuel Trust. Thank you, esteemed panelists, and my co-chair, Mark DuPont, for being here today in this University of Houston virtual maritime cyber domain. Our audience may read the detailed bios on the website under speakers. Briefly about our presenters, our first presenter is Captain USN retired John Sanford. Captain Sanford is undoubtedly a well-recognized leader in maritime security. His experience across a wide range of maritime security activities spans more than 46 years of military, contractor, and civilian service as an intelligence and security professional. Captain Sanford is currently a National Maritime Intelligence Integration Office Department Head, leading the Maritime Security Department with NIMIO under ODNI's National Intelligence Management Council. Since 2017, he has led a team of domestic and international portfolio mission managers in a quote, whole of government approaches to deliver an effective understanding of the maritime domain within the intelligence community. Captain Sanford also brings to the panel his experiences involving aircraft carriers, amphibious ships, military operations as the U.S. Naval Attaché in Seoul, as well as senior intelligence officer and published author. Thank you, Captain Sanford, and thank you for your service. Our second presenter is Mr. Craig Moss, Acting Director and Senior Program Manager, National Security Program Office, National Security Sciences Directorate, at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory and U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel retired. He currently manages and develops defense and homeland security research and development programs that are unique in the nation and seek to solve a range of national security challenges. Some of his current activity areas include advanced materials, uh, clean energy, neutron science, nuclear sciences, and supercomputing. Acting Director Moss also brings a military medical and health physics background, having served as a military army, uh, tackled many of the assignments in these very areas. Thank you, Acting Director Moss, and thank you for your service. Our third presenter is Dr. Martin Luther, Director of the Center for Maritime and Port Studies at the University of South Florida College of Marine Science, where he co-directs the Coastal Ocean Monitoring and Prediction System. Dr. Luther's passion for marine science research currently involves a combination of real-time ocean observations with numerical models of ocean currents and processes, including their applications. For example, applications range from maritime safety and security to water quality in estuaries to variability in large-scale ocean circulation and its relation to climate change. Dr. Luther is also highly active in numerous other organizations and entities dedicated to the marine sciences. Thank you, Dr. Luther, for all you do. Our fourth presenter is Mr. Darren Shelton, a well-known 25-year veteran of the maritime industry and now also a maritime entrepreneur. In 2018, he envisioned a blockchain startup for the downstream energy sector, which led to his co-founding Fuel Trust, a data science company with software solutions. He also brings to the panel his substantial knowledge and experience, having managed multiple shipping companies serving as lead auditor in ISO quality management systems, and most recently being tasked with driving their digital initiatives for a premier global maritime agency. Mr. Shelton is also active with many maritime committees and serves on boards for several community organizations. Thank you, Darren Shelton. I will now turn it over to Captain John Sanford. Thank you very much, David. I appreciate those kind words. And I also appreciate the opportunity for allowing me to discuss threats and their impacts on the security and the resilience of the global maritime supply chain. I recently read an article from uh, NC State that in recent decades, global supply chains have become larger and more complex, designed for efficiency costs and proximity to markets. 
And at the same time, unanticipated shocks that affect global production have grown more frequent and severe, exposing vulnerabilities in the supply chains. Companies and policymakers are reconsidering how to assess, analyze, and mitigate risk exposure to shocks like financial crises, terrorism, extreme weather, and pandemics to ensure supply chain resiliency. The global supply chain disruptions are growing in frequency and severity. The COVID-19 pandemic is the most significant global supply chain shock in recent years. Shocks to the global supply chain are described by a level of their severity, frequency, and lead time, or that ability to anticipate or predict the event. A MGI report identifies two broad categories of global supply chain shocks, catastrophes and disruptions, each of which can further be defined or whether or whether or not they're anticipated or unpredictable. Catastrophes are historically remarkable events that cause trillions of dollars in losses. Catastrophes may uh, be unanticipated and unforeseeable or could be predictable. An example of an unanticipated catastrophe could be a major hurricane. While early on it's forecast, its track changes. And these tracks from past seasonal observations allows us to have one area prepare for it and abruptly it changes. And we saw that happen this year on the East Coast of the United States. Examples of disruptions could be the 2017 not Petya cyber attack or local military conflict, conflicts. Currently what's going on in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Guinea where there are piracy attacks and attacks on our merchant ships or domestic turmoil, most recently you've seen in Afghanistan. Those all affect the global supply chain. The maritime domain, the ocean, seas, waterways and nearly everything they touch is a valuable global supply chain resource requiring priority attention to preserve freedom of navigation, protect the free use of global maritime transportation systems, and to deter, prevent, and disrupt harmful or unlawful activities. The enormity of this largely ungoverned area includes seabed to space, multi-domain complexities associated with maritime governance, and the rapid pace of technological change are some of the challenges that make it difficult to detect, identify, track, and protect maritime threats. Key maritime domain threats that cause catastrophes or disruptions include the changing character of these maritime threats. For example, our strategic competition with Russia and China is a major concern that has from global to regional to local impacts. Strategic competition, formerly known as GPC or Global Peer Competition, includes hybrid and gray zone activities. Gray zone activities are characterized as events that occur below the level of military armed conflict. They include coercion, such as we've seen what the Chinese have done in the Spratly Islands, law warfare, where countries are using our own legal system against us, political action, like we have seen in the Ukraine and Georgia, influence operations. And you know, for Russia, they employ a strategy called Moskorovka. It's very complex use of deception and disinformation. Also, you see economic uh, events such as the Chinese influence in Africa and South America, commercial activity. You know, China's global fishing fleet is depleting our maritime protein in the seas. Espionage, you know, foreign surveillance of the global supply chain is identifying areas to exploit, exploit by these state actors. And then of course, state-sponsored hostile operations in cyberspace. The gray zone is the battle space and hybrid is the warfare. Our threats and challenges in the maritime domain also include non-state bad actors, such as transnational organized crime, such as the Mexican drug cartel or terrorism. You know, Al-Qaeda and ISIS are still active and maritime criminal actions, such as motorcycle gangs in the Pacific Islands peddling drugs. Also, polar issues and climate change have increased access to maritime shipping, leading to increased militarization and competition over these resources. The challenges that arise in managing and using the overwhelming volume, velocity, variety, veracity, and complexity of maritime data also helps to mitigate or denigrate the resiliency of our global supply chains. 
To be resilient, ports and maritime industry have to be fully invested in being aware and prepared. Too many think this will never happen to us, or they have never conducted testing to determine what the vulnerabilities in their facilities or structure is. Resiliency is the ability to cope with these catastrophes and shocks and to emerge stronger from these experiences while protecting the global supply chain such that it is not disrupted. The most important thing is the sharing of information related to the maritime threats and all of our current experiences across whole of nation from federal, state, local, tribal, territorial, international to the private sector of maritime industry. That is the key to being resilient. Let us not have the need to know limitations, but the responsibility to share. That's the mentality we need to develop. So I thank you for listening today and I look forward to your questions or observations. Thank you. John, there are a whole bunch of things you just unpacked, or at least you threw at us that are cause almost for a panel discussion all to themselves. And I just want to throw out a couple here just to think about when we get to the end of this and we do some of the conversation. I think these are something to come back to. One of the things that struck me immediately is how you talked about the catastrophes and all the different types. And my thought was, you know, is there something in that long list that's just more prevalent right now that's either increasing or is top on your list on the National Maritime Intelligence and Integration Office? Is there some reason that that rises to the top? I just, that, that's a question that just popped in my mind. Um, the other one that kind of made me start thinking, if you look at all those things that you were listing all those things that have a direct impact on our maritime domain, on our, the United States maritime domain. What just struck me is, I think more people need to know about that because I don't think they do. I think we, we end up trying to bang that drum and make people hear about it because all of us in it recognize its importance but I just think it's still waning the, the understanding of the full impact of what the maritime domain means to our country. It is said by many, you know, it is our lifeblood, right? That's how we get our blood. That's how we get our stuff. Uh, and there's all these things that seemingly might look like on the nightly news to be far away. But do they have an impact? So I'd really like to talk more about that. But I, like I said, I, I digress. We could go down that path right now, but I'll save it for later. And with that happy thought, let's turn it over to Dr. Luther. Mark, if you want to take the floor here, you can share your screen and you can take it, sir. Thank you for that and for the introduction. Again, I'm Mark Luther. I'm on the faculty at the USF College of Marine Science, where I head the Center for Maritime and Port Studies. And much of what I'm going to talk about um, is exists in large part for the same reason that this nice pretty bridge across Tampa Bay uh, exists, the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. In 1980, uh, the old Skyway Bridge was struck by an inbound uh, commercial vessel that was overtaken by an intense uh, early summer squall line that blew it out of the channel with 60 knot winds on the beam, uh, blinding rain, uh, and the vessel struck one of the main supports of the southbound span of the bridge, uh, causing it to collapse and 35 people to lose their lives. Uh, as part of that, NOAA uh, National Ocean Service implemented the first physical oceanographic real-time system that went operational in 1991. Uh, they produced a commemorative video of the 30th anniversary of NOAA ports that you can see at this link. Um, so for much of the last double 25 or 30 years, I've been involved in operation and maintenance of the Tampa Bay physical oceanographic real-time system, the first uh, of its kind in the U.S. It's uh, 
strategically placed sensors that measure winds, waves, currents, tides, visibility, and other parameters at critical locations for bringing vessels in and out of the Tampa Bay port facilities. Again, it went operational in 1991, and we worked out an agreement uh, in collaboration with the NOAA National Ocean Service, what they call their Center for Operational Ocean Products and Services, and the local maritime community to house it within our lab at the university. Uh, again, all the data come in continuously every six minutes uh, and are ported over to the NOAA National Ocean Service, their continuous operational real-time monitoring system for quality assurance and, and quality control. Uh, originally, the main uh, method of accessing the port's data was through a voice response system, like the, the old systems that used to read off your bank balance. That's still operational, but of course, uh, most people access it through the internet, and that's our landing page, just tbports.org. The actual official NOAA URL is much longer, uh, but I, I had to create this landing page so we could paint it on the side of that wave buoy down there at the bottom. So around the edges, you see just a few of our, our sites. Uh, one of our offshore uh, current measuring sites on a Coast Guard navigational buoy in the upper left, our mid-bay site that has a full suite of meteorological sensors, as well as current sensors and fog sensors. And then we have a, a current sensor under the center span of the Skyway Bridge at other sites. So this is a map of all of the sites that exist now. Again, Tampa Bay Ports was the first of its kind, uh, perhaps in the world, uh, and continues to expand. Uh, it started out with 11 oceanographic and meteorological sensors at seven sites. We've now expanded that to 35 individual sensors at 15 locations, including additional current sensors at critical zigs and zags in the, the ship channel, uh, additional wind sites uh, concentrated up around the port of Tampa uh, to facilitate cruise ship vessels cruise ship movements in and out of the, the terminals in downtown Tampa, um, atmospheric visibility sensors out in the middle of the bay, uh, an additional directional wave buoy out at the entrance to the main ship channel offshore of, of the bay entrance, and uh, a new air gap sensor on the center span of the Skyway Bridge that measures instantaneous vertical clearance under the bridge. So again, Tampa Bay was the first, but it very quickly caught on among other ports. And we now have NOAA capital PORTS systems operational in 38 ports around the US. This is one of our more recent ones. This is a, a current sensor that clamps on to a, a standard Coast Guard navigational buoy. Uh, we have great support from Sector St. Petersburg. This is us maintaining that sensor on the deck of the Coast Guard cutter Joshua Appleby and another photo of a, one of our local work boats um, working on the system as a large product, petroleum product carrier uh, exits the bay. Uh, this is that new air gap sensor. Again, it's a, basically a radar altimeter that measures the instantaneous distance between the low steel on the bridge and the water surface to facilitate the movements of increasingly uh, large and, and tall vessels that, that pass through the ship channel. Again, all this real-time data are integrated into the Cooperative Vessel Traffic Service for Tampa Bay. Uh, all are available on the web, but they're also available as pop-ups on the Tampa Bay Pilots carry-on unit shown in the upper left here. Um, recent studies have shown that since this system became operational in 1991, ship groundings have decreased by two thirds. So that's a, a huge uh, increase in safety and efficiency of transits in and out of Tampa Bay. Well, having all of that real-time data has led us down multiple other paths to how, we, how can we optimize the, the utility of all of this real-time vessel information, the real-time oceanographic and atmospheric information in promoting safe and efficient vessel transits. One of our most recent research 
veins is that we have partnered with Polestar Global. The Polestar supplies all of the vessel tracking data for the, the US government, as well as 59 other maritime governments around the world. We're working with them to merge all of that vessel tracking information with all of this real-time meteorological and oceanographic data using artificial intelligence and machine learning platforms to do things like detecting anomalous, anomalous vessel movements you know, to prevent piracy or smuggling or illegal fishing operations, but also just to optimize vessel transits to take advantage of favorable wind wave current tide information to get vessels uh, in and out of ports uh, in a, a most efficient manner, concentrating on that transit from the sea buoy into the dock facilities at particular ports. We've also partnered with uh, several maritime, well, several autonomous and uncrewed surface vessel providers, uh, including maritime tactical systems over Melbourne, Florida, Romeo Papa boats in Homa, Louisiana, and others to look at the use of how to optimally utilize uh, these uncrewed surface vessels for maritime security applications, for environmental monitoring, and for hydrographic mapping, uh, particularly in emergency response. Uh, we're working closely with the NOAA Office of Coast Survey through our new Center for Ocean Mapping and Innovative Technologies to look at how NOAA's uh, navigation response teams can utilize these uncrewed surface vessels to, as a force multiplier to augment uh, their channel surveys after uh, major storm events so that they can clear the channel and get the port facilities open as quickly as possible after these adverse uh, weather events. And again, our goal is to prevent this um, using the best information possible uh, to and get it to the into the hands of people moving vessels in and out of harbors to prevent collisions and elisions that may shut down the ship channel and and impede port operations. So with that, I'll close and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mark. Uh, again, a couple of questions you know pop into my mind as I look at that position data AI. Uh, type of stuff that you're working on, and you mentioned it, uh, making, using it to detect vessels that are there that maybe shouldn't be there based on their movements. Um, they're, they're moving in an in, in uncongruous pathway. They're, they're going a way that they shouldn't be going. I would think also that weather has something to do with that, right? Uh, you know, weather is bad right. in a certain place, uh, usually the, the ships are going to take refuge here. They're going to anchor here. All of a sudden there's this ship that's, that's not doing that. Why, why, was, why is that ship not doing that? Right. Um, I think that the application there, and which led me to ponder, and uh, Mark, we've talked a lot over the years about many things like this, but I, one of my thoughts is that there's a lot of stuff that you just exposed that you were working on that I think have a lot of different connections to what the safety and security and resilience of the maritime domain is. I think there's also a lot of others out there doing things like that. I, my, my personal opinion, and we can talk more about this when we go to the discussion point, but I think there's a disconnect there. We're, we're, we're not aware of all the things, key stakeholders that might be in really good positions to connect some dots, uh, people like, John and, and Nimio, people like Craig, he'll be talking here in a moment. But man, if we could just make sure that that information flowed, and it, it's, it's ironic in a sense, John, because it's uh, we're, we're talking about fusion. We're just like we talk about Intel fusion, we're talking about fusion of information and saying, wait a minute, look at what the University of South Florida is working on. Is, is there an application that can help us in this particular thing? And Craig, I know we talked about some of these sensors as it relates to, you know, predicting uh, blue, uh, uh, if there's some sort of chemical release, if there's some sort of biological release, 
what is that what does all that weather information tell us about where that particular cloud may go and how do we react to that so it's uh, i just think it's fascinating i think there's so much there there's so much capabilities that we have there's so many very smart people uh, like your group mark and and many others that are working together how do we connect those dots so that'll be one of the discussion point discussion points thank you mark um Craig Moss from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Sir, I would like to offer you the floor. Uh, uh, just by a quick way of introduction, one, uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, one of the DOE national laboratories. And so uh, my intention today is not to talk about any deep aspects of the science we're doing, uh, as much as it would be way over my head. But I want to hopefully maybe look at some of the direction we see some of these science applications going uh, and maybe stimulate a few uh, questions for us to think about as a community in the maritime risk space. So where, where am I coming at? If I were to look at Oak Ridge National Lab and look at some of the research areas that we're doing, you can see it's, you know, we obviously have a very uh, strong emphasis in the electric grid and uh, just the energy sector in and of itself. But a lot of, there's a huge amount of work, everything from the cybersecurity, quantum science, um, manufacturing uh, technologies and how we look at that uh, in the uh, just the computing leadership type of activities. So as I go through this, uh, as Mark asked me this question of, you know, what is, what do you see in technology and uh, where are one, the opportunities, uh, but probably also thinking about this from where are our challenges that these technologies are uh, going to bring and Mark did a nice job of uh, kind of teeing up some of my first conversations. And so what I want to talk about is kind of focus on just critical infrastructure at large. Uh, and then uh, energy uh, infrastructure dependencies. Um, Mark did a nice job of uh, outlining what we're looking at is how we're looking at data fusion in a, in a port. But how do we think about this when we start thinking about it in a larger context and I'll go over that. But, uh, just touch on a couple of other areas as we go through. So um, critical infrastructure in, uh, dependencies. One of, the, one of the exciting things that I see on our horizon uh, this year, we're looking to launch the next supercomputer for the, the country. Um, and this one's an exciting one because we're going into exascale computing. Um, so the Frontier system is gonna be five times faster than the top five supercomputers that exist in the world today. Um, that's, that's interesting in and of itself and it's an, an, uh, an exciting science challenge, just to how do you design that system and how do you get it? But what becomes interesting in this one is, as I start thinking about, uh, if we think about any of our uh, operating environments, whether that be a port, our, our business, our a state, a region, a country, the nation, uh, or the globe. Um, the, the interdependencies between all of the critical infrastructures are just almost insurmountable. How many data points, how many nodes are there? Um, if I were just to think about the ports, where are they, you know, from the energy sector, you know, where are the most critical substations that are feeding your ports that if they were impacted would, you know, impact your port operations or uh, being able to get things into or out of a port. If I think about that from the transportation sector, the finance sector, uh, if I look at all of these things, if I were to take any one of these critical infrastructure sectors, the, the amount of information and data in, in any one of these things is daunting. And uh, we're really now starting to see uh, when we start to look at like Frontier and I start to look at this technology, <clears throat> our ability to have the computational power to really start to understand all of these, uh, have, be able to process all the data and all the information around each of these individual critical infrastructures uh, is a tremendous opportunity. But the ability to look at the dependencies or the interdependencies between them uh, is even more uh, exciting in my mind. So how do we start thinking about uh, that uh, in our future and trying to ask the question, if only I could you know, see the impacts or the relationships between these sectors, what might that look like? And how can we look at some of the computing power to do that? So switching to another you know, big topic as we look at you know, staying in the computational space and we think about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning. 
uh, everybody is, whether you realize it or not, everybody is seeing AI uh, applications. You know, everything from, you know, when I get onto my navigation apps with my Apple phone, uh, phone uh, you know, all of the AI and machine learning algorithms that went into how do I get from one point to another and take in traffic congestion and, and deal with all these real time type of data uh, aspects. So AI, AI is uh, pretty fascinating, right? So, and we all like it. So everybody wants to have more AI. Um, but the question I would ask us is twofold. Um, one is, are we ready? Do we know that once we start installing these AI algorithms uh, or systems using AI, how do we assure that they're doing the things that we think they are? If we were to think about, you know, how would I balance my checkpoint? you know, or checkbook or my banking account, you know, I had a pretty simple process that I could go through, right? So I can, you know, see, you know, accounts in and accounts out uh, and then add it all up. But when I start looking at AI assurance, this problem becomes so large. Um, how am I actually starting to make sure these approaches are doing what I think they are? The, the other aspect that I would throw out on AI is in machine learning in that space is, if I apply that uh, logic today, or I develop the new logic today, how long is that logic still good for? So am I refreshing my machine learning? Am I refreshing my AI algorithms? Am I taking in uh, new considerations that might be uh, uh, being built into those algorithms uh, and then you know, changing the way I'm seeing the information that I think I'm seeing? The, the, the counterpart of this is our adversaries are doing this. So think about now that AI becomes available and we start thinking about disinformation campaigns, uh, obviously a popular topic during our last election cycle. Um, as I start thinking about this from um, the ability to manipulate a video. So imagine if an adversary had gotten in here and then all of a sudden they were able to start to change uh, and use AI to uh, change the message that I'm giving. So it looks like I'm talking, but it's really Mark giving a message. Um, how does that start to factor in when we start thinking about, say, emergency response and our risk communication messages where we're trying to get information to populations to, to take specific act activities? Um, so thinking about AI, it's great, but we also need to start thinking about what is the, how do we make sure that we're getting what we are and we have trust in that AI system uh, or that we can recognize when somebody is using AI in a nefarious way, and we can recognize that and uh, get in front of it. So great opportunities, great challenges along that. Uh, another one that's fascinating to watch, uh, I don't know how many times you look, uh, quantum computing and communications is a uh, emerging technology. Uh, it's at its infancy. Um, but an interesting statistic is if we think about uh, you know, some, some things. Phones today are faster than we use the, the computer systems we used in the Apollo's uh, 11 space flights. So a 40 plus year span of time and we've seen the computer capabilities. If I were to look at the quantum computing industry in 2019, uh, the industry is about $507 million. It's predicted to be 64 billion by 2030. So you can imagine the explosion of technology in computing uh, quantum capabilities that are starting to come in. And, and we're starting to see quantum applications. And an interesting uh, article that I was looking at, and this is Volkswagen. Volkswagen is using uh, you know, traditional uh, scale computing to be able, or, or classical computing approaches. And they're being able to, we can map traffic congestion and in infrastructure around a, a city uh, and just how traffic patterns move, for example. They're using the then quantum chips to figure out what is, how does a vehicle operate or get optimized within that environment and all of the decisions that that vehicle can make uh, if I wanted to be able to figure out how to, you know, um, maximize my fuel efficiency or minimize the time of transit or avoid certain obstacles. So now we're starting to see classical computing and quantum computing come in in different ways. So thinking quantum computing as these become more uh, available to us and these become more robust, 
starting to open this idea of, of optimization of systems. So now I can think about a disaster recovery. What is the fastest way to get systems back online and which one should I choose first? So can I use these quantum technologies to do this? And then in the communication side, we're starting to look at you know, all of these encryption ideas. So information becomes harder. So if we start thinking about uh, you know, malware applications or people, you know, adversaries trying to freeze our data, you know, can they use these quantum encryption technologies to, to make it near impossible to get our data? So how do we have to really think about that? And then the last uh, area I want to talk about is just kind of a broader supply chain. So we know in the maritime, we're uh, all very familiar of trying to say, how do I get products manufactured, moved around the globe, into a port, through a port, into their destinations? We all are familiar with uh, supply chain. And I think COVID in our last year and a half has really opened our eyes to start to look at that supply chain disruption. And so we all know I can't get, uh, you know, Ford, uh, as an example, can't get chips out of, you know, eight, you know, manufacturing in Asia. And so now you've got whole disruptions in, in vehicle fleets and the ability of consumers to buy that. So what does that mean to us from a technology standpoint? One area I would look at is, is how do we start looking at advanced manufacturing? And when we think about this, I think about the 3D printing, the technologies associated with it, robotics, uh, all things around manufacturing processes. And so what we're seeing though, is, is if we think about, uh, I'll use just 3D printing as a thing, the technologies are starting to, uh, the, the entry point, the technologies are coming up. So we cannot just print in you know, any one type of materials, we can combine materials. I can combine metals and polymers. I can type, combine different types of metals. Um, so I'm getting different performance parameters in manufacturing systems and these additive uh, type systems uh, that I've never seen before. And they're really changing the way I think about uh, how I make things. Um, the other thing that's really exciting about this is, is as we start to see this technology advance, we're starting to see the barrier to the entry point uh, go down. So now we can start to see mom and pop type shops having additive manufacturing capability and they can start to, now I can start to think about my supply chain and my manufacturing uh, chain as a distributed network. So it's not, doesn't have to be one big forge or foundry type operation. I can now distribute this and now my resilience and security around manufacturing uh, are increased. And how does that impact us? The other way I would say is, is think, can't, if you can think about a product that you bought in the last year that is not uh, some part sensor in computing and all the things that go with all of these tech, uh, insertion of technologies, um, what are our cyber vulnerabilities? If we think about cybersecurity, a lot of us are going to go into the, you know, the physical hygiene and malware and IT systems, right? But if I buy a, a product and it's, think about your car, the last time you bought a car, how many cyber systems are interconnected in that car to make that car work? And as we start thinking about the autonomy and vehicles interacting within the traffic system and within them uh, with each other and communicating with each other as we think about you know, autonomous driving, um, that's a lot of powerful sensors and everything else. But when you bought that car, did you think about cybersecurity of that? When we're thinking about buying products and these internet of things, and if you think about, if I look across that picture in, uh, in the slide and all of the things where I have sensors and communications and electronics that are in there, um, did somebody do a cyber vulnerability on every one of those products? And when we look at cyber vulnerability and we look at all the attacks, you know, our adversaries are looking for the easiest way to get into our systems. And so are we thinking about all of our attack points and the cybersecurity that's related to that? And then the final uh, piece I will pose, um, are we thinking about changes in our risk paradigms as we look at these new technologies or we uh, evolve it? So taking this from the energy sector and thinking about this, um, we are we're spinning as a country. We are deploying a lot of green technology, solar and wind, uh, and obviously trying. There's a lot of great benefits in our uh, to reduce our dependence on fossil fuel and cleaner uh, 
environment and all the things that go with that. But let me draw, take us back to February of this year uh, in uh, winter storm Uri. And so in, in deploying all these technologies, Texas has been a leader in deploying lots of these wind farms. And so as I put more of these wind farms online and I started using them as my uh, significant portion of my power generation component, Winter Storm Uri comes along and freezes every one of those wind farms. And so now I've lost my uh, power generation that many of the people, and obviously during a winter storm, I don't wanna lose the ability to heat my house and get the electricity that I need uh, to, to keep people uh, safe and secure. So as we think about all of these technologies, are we changing the way we think about our risk paradigms and the implications that that does? And so, um, and are we keeping up with it? So with that, um, where the exciting thing is, is as, I, as we look at these science and technologies, some of the things that I always say is we're looking at, you know, we like to think of things like quantum and say, that's 10 years down the road. I mean, when am I going to see that? But if we're not planning for it today, then we're reacting it to it tomorrow. So how do we think about these coming in and be proactive in our process as opposed to reactive? So thank you. Well, uh, you too, Craig, uh, got me thinking on a lot of different pathways. Like I said, we could do a panel discussion. We could do an afternoon discussion on any one of these. But th there's a fascinating thing that came to me as you were talking. You used this word, these words. You said interdependencies, one sector to another. And... Uh, it goes to uh, what, John, you and I were talking before we even started the panel discussion, you know, and how do we learn from one port to another? And I'm going to cough here in a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. As, how, how do we learn? How do we share the information that we're learning? And the conversation extended into what Mark was talking about. How do we ensure that all the things that Mark is gathering with his research and his work with NOAA and, and on the AI side of things, how does that now start helping in other aspects of the, I'm just talking the maritime domain, but obviously they transition to all different domains and all different verticals. When you look at AI and when you look at that quantum computing part, Craig, when you look at all the sensors that Mark is looking at and how that's used to maybe not only predict what the better way of doing something is, but it also helps us identify behavior that isn't of the norm. There's, there's something here that's not adding up and we ought to pay attention to that from a security perspective. And, and last but not least, and this leads right into what Darren's going to talk about from the, from the port operator perspective, but you look at all these things when you look at the port function and an industry that operates on the slimmest of margins to begin with, and John, you led off with that. You made that comment to be, you know, in your presentation. The, my thought process says it makes more sense to utilize these tools and leverage these tools as best as possible to uh, make notion of those slim margins and maybe increase them. But more importantly, there's also an obligation to make it available in a way that isn't so cost prohibitive. So a long spin of words there to connect all the dots here. But I think that how do we do this in such a way? Because there's so many exciting things that are going on. How do we continue to keep the pedal on them and continue to do them? How do we ensure that we are recognizing those inter interdependencies that we're sharing that information from a fusion type perspective? How do we utilize the rapid advance of AI in a way that is of benefit uh, to all of us to lower those margins, to recognize there might be more efficient ways to do that? And most importantly, you know, the subject of the symposium is how do we identify those potential risks and keep ourselves more secure? How do we, how do we wrap that all into a nice uh, bow? I'll say that uh, you know before this symposium, we were even talking about what the subject was going to be. We personally at the National Maritime Law Enforcement Academy are are looking at that. That was the conversation John and I were having, and Mark and I have had, and Craig, you you and I have had it too. H how do you how do you create a a digital 
print, if you will, a digital twin of every port that you can in turn now use AI tools to start assessing what those vulnerabilities are. Where are those weak points? And I'm not just talking about security. Where are those weak points that we can now, is there something else that can be leveraged? And is Mark learning something that can be plugged into that constant ongoing machine learning that's looking at that port uh, print, that's looking at all the things that are going on in that port and saying, hey, here is not only a vulnerability from a security perspective, but here's a better way that we might be able to do that. So a lot to talk about there, but I think we set Darren up for uh, a good perspective from the port view. And with that said, I will turn it over to Darren. Well, you gentlemen have certainly raised some important points about potential concerns that we need to take into practical consideration at a port operational level. In my 25 plus years of getting ships in and out of ports, I've seen many of these threats become realities and can certainly attest to their criticality. At the heart of every port call is a shipping agent that is focused on getting a ship in and out as safely, securely, and seamlessly as possible. And that agent is going to interface with the ship owner, the operator, the charter, or the terminal, the authorities, the vendors. And for that reason, every good agent understands that communication is key. And when I hear these threats talked about, I'm reminded of that even more so. And so to that end, I think one of the biggest areas that we have to work on and that touches on most, if not all of these points that we've heard discussed here is the flow of data in a port call. Whether we're dealing with hurricanes that force ships to evacuate the port under the direction of the U.S. Coast Guard or the FBI that may be watching for cyber attacks that may be trying to bring down a port's cargo handling system or CBP working to ensure that all of the crew members coming to and from ships are safeguarded, all of it requires good data flow. Most people don't realize that 90% of our world's goods are moved by ocean transportation, which means if you want to destabilize a global economy, impacting the shipping sector is a prime way to do it. Now, we're not trying to give bad actors good ideas, but we do have to raise awareness of our correctable vulnerabilities so that we can address these issues before they become real problems. For example, if a ship agency isn't hardened in their cybersecurity, that could open the door for a bad actor to access valuable proprietary information that could inform their efforts to cause harm. They could possibly pass malware coming from a seemingly trusted source, and this could lead to better planned social engineering that could strategically position them for even more malicious activities. So at some point, we've got to insist on some standardizations in the operational arena that will better safeguard our infrastructure's access points. For example, how vendors gain access to ships via historically antiquated gate lists that are produced by agents on demand. Well, that's ripe for change. And I'm glad to know that some people are working on it. And we've heard comments about interdependencies amongst our critical infrastructure assets. And this too is a key area. Technology has now enabled us to move past simple tabletop exercises where we can use digital twinning to simulate how chain reactions in a port might occur. So instead of just digital twinning a single refinery along the ship channel, we can now bring multiple facilities into a massive simulation where we can run scenarios and anticipate what sort of corrective actions might need to occur. And we have huge amounts of existing data that we can plug into AI tools that can help us pinpoint where a problem is predictably going to happen next and with what sense of probability that it might occur. And so between those two technologies, we can then use backpropagation to correct the estimated to actual vectors to better refine the next simulation each time, getting more accurate and thus reducing the guesswork about what might need to be done. But to enable all of this, we've got to have more data sharing between stakeholders. 
And absent that level of transparency, which is likely due to a lack of trust, we're leaving ourselves both ignorant and exposed. We can't do anything with what we're not willing to talk about candidly. In recent years, we've gotten a lot better on predicting when a storm was going to land where and how that might impact a given port. But we've got to go beyond that because we're about to start seeing some semi-autonomous ships coming in our ports. And we got to think about what that looks like at an operational level. The agent may not be giving boarding instructions to a master on the bridge, but instead be communicating with somebody who's remotely controlling that vessel from another country. So ensuring that that operator has validated data that they can securely authenticate, at least in part, is going to be absolutely critical to safe passage. Moreover, we're now faced with a race toward decarbonization that is leading to new alternative fuels that we've got to consider. In 2018, we had a problem with the fuel supply chain because of high paraffin products that wreaked havoc across our global supply chain. So just imagine a similar scenario where bad actors contaminated fuels with an intentional attack against targeted assets. Now, that's a completely untenable option, and yet its possibility is alarming to those that are in the know. So this goes past simple compliance with a regulatory mandate to the heart of risk assessment around port resiliency, which means we have got to work toward more reliable data sharing systems in port calls. We need to be integrating disparate solutions and reconciling similar ones. We need more automated and authenticated data streams. And we've got to abandon these low-tech operating procedures that waste time and money and increase the risk for malfeasance. We've most certainly got to eliminate this self-justified notion that we're fine and we don't need to change anything. And I would say in closing that the most dangerous thing to our ports is nothing. And by that, I mean, we can't do nothing. We cannot keep doing what we've been doing and expect things to change. So we have to do something, but in fairness, something is nearly as bad as nothing. And by that, I mean just doing any old something, because it's a proverbial step in the right direction, is not good enough either. And we've spent a lot of time and money on doing stuff because, well, at least it's something. And we got to start doing more smart somethings, doing things that we can monitor and measure the impacts and the outcomes, doing things where we can hold ourselves and our systems accountable, doing things where we can identify the improvement opportunities and then act upon them. And the good news is that discussions like this enable that. So I'm glad to be a part of doing this and looking forward to answering questions on how we can do it better. Thanks.